So basically, I'm looking to tie the entire world through Veritasium. I find Africa to be extremely interesting. Um, Africa, in my opinion, is China on steroids. Um, let me explain why I say that. Um, in the 1990s, you had three Asian um, countries uh, come through the World Trade Organization, WTO. You had Japan, you had um, South Korea, and you had China. Japan and South Korea had very vibrant uh, economies, particularly Japan. And when they accept, were accepted in the WTO, you know, their economic dynamicism exploded. Uh, Japan was one of the most vibrant economies, but then they went into a bubble and popped, like you know, every country would. Um, but in the meantime, they were buying the biggest and, or the best, most marquee assets out of the US, the Empire State Building, and Tush, et cetera. And then you know, they had the crash. You had South Korea, right? Again, very vibrant economy. Um, created the LGs and the Samsung. Samsung is one of the most dominant, you know, electronics company in the world. Um, and then, you know, the crash is not as severe as Japan. And then you had also China. Um, China's economy was not nearly as dynamic as Japan's or um, South Korea's. But China created much more of a presence on the world stage. The reason is those other two countries had hundreds of millions of um, people citizens. China at that time came in with one billion, over one billion. When you have over one billion workers and you're just coming into the economic stage, world stage, um, and you put them to work, you have a massive amount of economic capital you know, coming to fore. And that's what happened. China currently has one over 1.4 billion as of last year. Africa has one and a quarter billion as a continent. That means that that's a quarter billion more than China had when they came onto the world stage with the WTO. A couple of differences though. Africa's a continent, China's a country, okay? Um, that's one difference to the detriment of Africa relative to China. But Africa is the richest source of natural resources in the world without a close second. The second would probably be the US, or US of A, okay? But significantly behind Africa and the U.S. is probably the second richest source in the world. Now, what would happen if you could unite these 54 countries in Africa as a united China, okay, economically, and then bring both one and a quarter billion people to four, like the Chinese did, which caused them to basically become the world's manufacturer, and tie all these natural resources together. So you already have the leading natural resource producer. You have the third largest um, population in the world, and now you have them all united. It's like the United States of America or like the European Union. But it's not easy to do that. Uniting the European Union, the EU, um, in my opinion, the Euro itself, is a failed experiment. They took 17 disparate nations, 17 different languages, 17 different economies, 17 different cultures, 17 different legal frameworks, mushed them together and had them walk lockstep behind the Franco-German um, economic machine. So the economy is tuned to Germany and to a lesser extent France and that actually breaks those who can't keep step or vibrate at a different tenor. And so the result is the weakening of the euro, bailouts for um, Greece and you know um, Portugal, um, Spain breaking the Italian banks or you know a horror story written twice. These multiple bailouts, um, they, you bail out Greece, then you bail out Greece again, then you bail out Greece again, and they default. And the reason this is happening is because they cannot set their own monetary policy, and they're following behind the monetary policy that was designed for them. And it's not just Greece. Um, the second largest economy that would have been in the Euro has pulled out, which is this area, the Great Britain. Um, and it's basically a mess. How did we get this way? Well, it is my contention that those who created the euro were attempting to replicate the United States and the United States of America. And the United States is a very strong example of what happens when you, you actually create a united union under a single currency, or a single economic unit, a single unit of account, a token, and one big centralized wallet, such as a central bank. You know, just to throw the correlations there. But um, they want to take a shortcut. They want to try it in 20 or 30 years and not go through what the United States went through. 
um, without the United States protections. So to put this in uh, perspective, the United States didn't go to war, World War twice with itself. And it couldn't because there's a gigantic puddle on one side called the Atlantic Ocean, and there's a large puddle on the other side called the Pacific Ocean. It makes it very difficult for the United States to participate in on-soil wars. You could send other people off to fight, nobody comes to burn up the United States. Plus, North and South, you had natural allies of Canada and Mexico. You also had not 17 different languages to contest with. You had uh, one, which makes it very easy. Um, you had one currency at the time. And even then, the United States still had to suffer war. You had the Civil War, where the United States went to war with itself. The term decimate um, basically came from the Civil War, where 10% of the male population was gone, you know, just like that. Um, and you had free labor for 250 years. You had free labor from African slavery. Um, it sort of makes a difference. Before then, you still had this, um, free labor. You had Chinese labor, you had Native American labor, and you had indentured servitude from the, um, the European, I don't know if you call them immigrants, because not all, everybody came over voluntarily. Not quite as bad as African slavery, but you can see um, there's a lot that went into the success. And then being isolated from multiple wars, and then America benefited from the wars. That's how the production and industrialization engine came on board. And then technology, because a lot of the immigrants who had a lot of intellectual capital actually came to the United States because they were persecuted. So that's where you had Albert Einstein and the atomic bomb, and which was used to go back and bomb Europe, et cetera. So a, a sense of inclusion is what created the United States. Not all of it voluntarily inclusion, not all of it fair. And these things come melded together to create an economic superpower, a geopolitical superpower, and a military superpower. So I fully understand the EU trying to do this, but you have to wait 300 to 650 years and go through all the bloodletting, um, plus have these natural borders. Now, this is a very long-winded way of saying, look how powerful I can make Africa a Pan-African Union based upon a Pan-African economic token, a very sub-token. I can take the euro and I can program it via smart contract to adapt to all 54 different economies, 54 different exchange rates, tie together all these exchanges, all these economies, all these commodities, and trade them freely in throughout Africa as a single union. And then, if that is done, Africa is the second largest economic power in the world vying for the EU. Um, for the EU losing the UK, it's a possibility they may fall if they do. It competes with China. But no matter which way you look at it, you have US, China, EU. The EU is not a country, but it is a trading bloc. Africa. I can see Africa moving above the EU, potentially above China, and then vying for number two. This is very different from the typical um, blockchain company. When you hear them talk, usually they don't talk of world domination and global macroeconomics and changing the power structure. This is what I see, okay? Basically, reducing friction, reducing costs, increasing inclusion, and making things um, zero trust capable. So you can do business without having to trust who you're doing business with. Um, changing the way the world works.